like we can register how far inside the water it is so I can forward this information to the audio system. I think it's 27 total tracks. That look like this? No, only 23. Oh, only 23 oh, looking like this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> some of you who may work with FMOD a lot will probably have raised some red flags by now. Why do I have so many audio tracks in here? Well, hi, everyone. My name is Fabio. It's really cool that you all took your time on Friday afternoon to, to join in. It's super cool to have like an audience of really like audio professionals or students uh, who are working in the industry or going to very soonly. Um, I originally did an apprenticeship uh, as a application developer in the finance IT area, um, which took me four years. And after that, um, I was thinking about what I wanted to do with my life uh, now that I knew how to program. And um, I realized that video games is, are something that I'm very passionate about and that I would be like, which was like, okay, if I could do whatever I want, what would it be? And this was kind of the thing. So I started to uh, look into how I could possibly like end up working in video games. And there's uh, a, a program in Zurich uh, at the Zurich University of the Arts um, where you can study game design. And uh, I had to do like a pre-university pathway course in, in arts uh, to apply uh, to the uni and uh, kind of get a place in the program. Luckily, I got accepted there and uh, did three years of studying. Prior to this, I had no relation to sound at all like i have never played an instrument like it's it's not something that i played around with and uh, at some point during the program uh, i met chris <laughs> which uh, introduced us into like what sound is and uh, that it actually is something which is quite important and uh, quite a significant part of a game and uh, how sounds can be made and incorporated into a game to really elevate the whole experience and uh, I was really hooked. Uh, I was really, uh, it's not something that I thought about previously, but at this point I kind of realized, okay, this is really cool. And this is something I want to kind of dig into. Um, the, like we didn't really have exams or tests during the, the program at the university. We had like projects we had to, to make in, in teams and deliver. And I started to kind of take over the role of uh, like the sound guy and audio programmer uh, in all the projects that uh, we made after. And my bachelor project was kind of a music game, uh, a VR experience called Soundscape. I know it's a super original name and it was about um, simultaneously changing music and, and uh, landscapes, uh, similar to maybe some of you know uh, Panoramical. Uh, which is a really cool kind of music game. Uh, you should absolutely look up, uh, which was designed by a DJ who didn't want to like manually create his light shows for his like when he when he worked as a DJ. So he made that thing and released it on Steam and it's really cool to play around with. Yes, and after my degree, uh, or during my degree actually, I already met Goran and Don, who were working on far loan sales at the time. As a little bit of background, I think uh, Don did this project already as part of his bachelor, right? It was his bachelor project okay. only, but um, he decided to, like, after he finished his bachelor, he decided to continue the project as his master's degree together uh, with Goran. 
who was not involved previously. Uh, but then they started to like, yeah, they founded the company and they started to work on the project uh, simultaneously to doing their masters. Yes, and um, they knew that I had experience in FMOD from my bachelor's project and they needed someone uh, with, <laughs> with experience in FMOD to implement the dynamic music of for loan sales. Uh, which is kind of why I got onboarded into the project. Uh, originally, mostly as a programmer and not really a sound designer, but Joel, who is the composer of both Far games, was supposed to do the sound design. But when I joined, uh, this was uh, just shortly before Gamescom, we needed to deliver a demo build and somebody had to do the sound for it and Joel was not around. So I kind of uh, picked up where he left kind of, and try to, to finish the sound. And we realized that it was much more efficient to have someone doing the sound who is able to like implement the sounds directly into the engine and also who understands like both the programming side of the game as well as, as the audio part. Because FAR is a very physical game. So for example, if you crash into a wall with your vehicle, uh, you need to be able to kind of adapt the sound dynamically to how high the velocity of the ship was or what kind of material you crashed into. And it's just, if you have someone who is purely uh, on this audio side, like needs someone to provide them like the programming to be able to do this at all. And it was very efficient for us or for me to, to play around and implement stuff on my own. And that's why we... Uh, like after this point, uh, we decided that Joel was only going to like only was going to do the music and focus on the music, uh, whereas I would take over for the sound design. Mm -hmm. So actually, from what we heard from Nicola and from uh, an interview that we did with with Danny, uh, who was technical sound designer at Larian Studios. It's actually technical sound design that you do the 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 transition that you do the the sound design, but also the programming and the implementation a little bit. So you're venturing pretty far into that technical sound design because of your programming knowledge. Yes, I guess that's fair. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's um, it's just like when you have a really small studio, like we mm -hmm. when we release for our own sales, we've only been five people. It's really hard to have like people who were dedicated on just one aspect of the game. So it's, it's kind of a plus to have someone who's like a, a generalist. And it's, it's true, I think, in this area, but it's also, it also has been true for us in other areas. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, Philip uh, was game designer and level designer. And it's just like, if you work on a small team, you have to cover a lot of ground uh, with mm -hmm. very few people. So how many people are you now after the first part that you released, um, Loan Sales, and now Changing Tides? How big is the studio now? Okay, uh, we, we were six people working on Far Loan Sales, but not like, not like we didn't work like full job mm, uh, yeah. percentages. Uh, and we were 10 people working on Far Loan Sales, uh, Far Changing Tides. Mm -hmm. But yes. then also in a... In a more paid capacity so you did have the opportunity to increase the production budget and pay everybody yes yes this was really important for us like mm -hmm. when we decided that we wanted to do a second game that uh like we improved like the 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 working conditions and uh like crunch crunch less or not at all and pay ourselves like sustainable wages yes but we also like one of, of the things I talked before, like being like having only generalists on the team is also like a problem when you need somebody who's, for example, very well versed in tech art. Uh, mm -hmm. Because there was, for, for example, was something where we realized at some point that we like we needed the knowledge somehow in the team, but it would have taken a lot for us to invest the time to like get to a level where we can cover this ourselves mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so i guess it's it's a very common thing right i guess you also saw it it's still alive like the bigger the studio gets the more specialists i guess yeah. you had uh <clears throat> join join the studio exactly that is absolutely true yeah so i think before <laughs> we 
continue talking and talk everything about the sound, why don't we jump in and you show us a little bit of the game? Uh, okay, so first of all, I'm just like quickly going to show uh, a scene of the game. Maybe some of you don't know FAR at all. Like FAR, Lone Sales, was a indie game which released in 2018. And it was... Um, it's a, we call it an atmospheric uh, vehicle adventure. Okay, I think that's enough for now. So um, we've established that there's like this uh, small little character, we call it Toe, and uh, there's like this uh, huge ship uh, with, a, with a large sail, uh, which at the beginning of the game is like your primary source of uh, forward force. And uh, as the game progresses, you kind of uh, learn more about the world, uh, but also um, new ship mechanics and kind of um, get access to new features uh, inside and outside of the ship. Okay, so in terms of work progress, like when I started working on Far Alone Sales, like I mentioned before, we had very little uh, budget for, for salaries and stuff. So uh, time was very critical. Uh, we hardly do any Foley recording for our games. So uh, we, we did some Foley recording on, on both games, in Far Changing Tides, we did a two-day session in Joel's flat, where we recorded like a huge range of like household items. Uh, for example, a salad spinner, uh, which we later used for the ship's uh, oars. Like you get access to some oars uh, to to use an engine to drive away, or a Bioletti coffee machine which we integrated uh, into the engine sound and stuff. But it was just two days and everything else was taken from audio libraries, uh, mostly, mostly uh, artlist.io. And uh, was just like, I would describe my, my work process uh, similar to photo bashing is, is a term which is thrown around quite a bit. And I would describe my work process uh, very similar to like what, what photo bashing does. So I go to, to these audio libraries, I take the sounds and I try to find the magic kind of. Um, and I also, to use another very visual like uh, metaphor, like what is the core of the game? And I work around that. So in our case, that meant we spent, like we started doing sound for the ship and we spent a lot of time working on the sound for the ship and everything else was kind of um, just brought to the point that was needed. So interactive elements uh, get a lot of more attention and get attention earlier than for example, ambient sounds. Which is, um, I, I had a student uh, who, who does audio for audiobooks and stuff. And he said he always, or he learned to always start with the ambience and then kind of build on the ambience, uh, I guess, which is, uh, is, is also something you see in painting when you like paint with oil, you kind of have to do the background before you get into the foreground, which is the actual vocal point of the piece. But my, my work progress is always like, I start with the interactive elements of the game 
and then try to like derive everything from there if that makes any sense at all. It makes sense. <laughs> and I, I think that's an interesting aspect because I always thought that when you do the background, you ha have a little bit of time getting into the thinking model, that you get a feeling of the environment and then you can start placing the more important sounds. But you do it the other way around. You start with the important sounds first. Mm -hmm. did, did, did you think you have to go back at some point? Because yes, you started all the off... Time. <clears throat> okay, so a very okay. iterative process. It's extremely... I work super iteratively. Or, mm. or we, we work super iteratively. So mm. for example, like the process for, uh, for, for Far Changing Tides or the Far Game as well was like we start with like with the concept on paper, right? And then we build like a block out and the super primitive prototype, for example, of if there's like a puzzle or something, like we prototype the puzzle uh, in a very rudimentary way, both visually uh, and gameplay wise. And then once the gameplay is in place, we start to think about, okay, what are the interactive elements and what information does the player need to be guided through the puzzle in a pleasant way and mm. what are like what are the moments which are supposed to feel intrinsically motivating mm -hmm. uh what kind of uh extrinsic motivation do we have in place or do we need uh, to motivate the player and uh what kind of guidance does the player need and then we start to kind of place very still like drafts of visual feedback uh, and also drafts of or of audio feedback then once we've done that draft we go to the next object and we put the drafts there and we come back to it later and refine and mm -hmm. it's just that like the the core aspects of the games kind of get to be iterated over more mm -hmm. often and we start earlier there yeah so it's kind of like a white blocking thing you put sounds in that might fit then you see how they fit and make adjustments if necessary yes very much so <clears throat> Do you have any sort of direction? I mean, obviously you have the game Far Lone Sales with which mm -hmm. you defined a sort of musical style and, and audio style. Did you take that more into a planned experience for changing tides that you sat down and documented a bit the, the audio direction, the, an audio guide, uh, mm -hmm. or was that, no, let's jump right in and do iterative? Like we, we did some conception. We, we talked a lot about like how the game was supposed to feel uh, compared to Far Alone Sales because we wanted like it's we, we don't call it a sequel officially. We often talk about a companion title. Hmm. Um, we wanted to create something that like had its own identity and feel. And you see this, for example, if you compare the visuals of the two titles, Far Alone Sales was very much kept in just like grayscale and red tones, mm -hmm. uh, where we try to really diversify our color palette uh, in this game a bit, um, while maintaining this atmospheric quality and, and eeriness uh, that uh, the first title had. Um, and we also talked about how we can make the game feel similar in terms of audio, but what we need to do differently. So one thing that we talked a lot about was like the character of the ship, Be because it's really important that the player builds a connection to the vessel uh, they travel with. Uh, it was really important for us to, to give the ship a feeling. And we wanted the ship in Far Changing Tides to feel more like a kind of like a wild beast that you get to know better over the course of the game. So we, for example, uh, like something that we discussed before I started working on, on the audio really was to really push this uh, beastly kind of quality of the whole thing and like the much larger scale of the vehicle compared to the locomotive in the first game, uh, which was really important, for example. Like these were things that we talked about and we also talked about, like, narratively, there's the, the story that we try or the stories that we try to tell with the game are kind of layered. Um, so there's, like, this ancient civilization that you encounter several times during the game. But there's also, like, the traces of people who are, we call them survivors, um, 
who who survived whatever happened here relatively recently and are like traveling in front of you with some distance but they're still like it's much more recent so it's like you follow the traces of two different timelines and this was something for example where i tried to find visual identities for these two different timelines so when the player encountered uh like something that was related to either one of these topics uh there was like a sense of of common like aesthetics but also audio audio identity mm -hmm. but i think like the the thing with farlon sales is the aesthetic is in a in a space which is really forgiving <laughs> i think it's it's a really great project to start doing audio on because it's um visually the whole game is moving in a space between realism and a kind of naive children's book kind of aesthetic where for example like we have nice lightning and there's trees and water and everything but it's the, the the character is scaled in a in a way which is sort of abstract so we know it's not hyper realism so also in audio i i feel or i always felt like i had a, a lot of range between like super abstract audio design and uh leaning onto realism which was very forgiving and gave me a lot of space to kind of uh wiggle wiggle around uh in a space until i found something that i felt was like was good or fitting mm -hmm. and uh once i had found this for example for one of the two um for the, one of the two storylines for example it was just a question of uh reusing sounds and and trying to um tie it all together uh, iteratively again okay i don't know like we can we can look into the afmat project if that's of interest you talked about the the vehicle as this beast um in the previous game loan sales you had to cater to your vehicle right you had to bring it something to to fuel the engine you had to open the sails and close the sails so you could uh, travel so one of the characters of the main characters obviously was this machine that that needed to have some sounds to communicate with you what it needed so in what mm -hmm. way is the beast here and going over to the f mod section what kind of systems did you need to implement for that then okay i will quickly um show uh a scene of the game where you've progressed a little bit already mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I think that's enough for now. So this is uh, FMOD Studio. So FMOD has kind of two components. On one hand, it's like this huge, uh, vast programming API that can be used in games, but there's a really cool uh, visual interface with as well, which is called FMOD Studio. And this tool is a godsend if you work with audio people because it looks very familiar to them. It's very... Uh, if if like you know logic or or reaper or whatever you like to work in like this thing looks kind of familiar so you have like these audio tracks um where you can change the volume of a thing you can add effects to an audio track uh which you may know from your audio tools as well like you can put a reverb on something or a tremolo or whatever you like um but uh where fmod is kind of incredible is that you are able to add parameters uh, which are basically knobs which you can dynamically change 
from inside the game. So there's a, a interface of communication between the game and the audio tool. And we can, for example, in the game, depending on how far fast the ship goes, we can update this parameter and FMOD is going to know how fast the ship is. And whatever sound I want to react to this can, can react to how fast the ship goes. So you uh, can uh, make your sounds really dynamic. Uh, exactly. And th this is something that we used heavily throughout the game. Like we use it for music. We use it for, for collision sounds of the ship, obviously. Uh, but it's also something that we used in the engine as well. What kind of systems did we use to, um, to make the, the whole thing feel more like a being? I think I will quickly show some of the individual sounds that you just heard uh, in conjunction together with the music and everything. So one of the things I did, for example, was uh, there's a lot of like these groany kind of sounds that I incorporated into the sound design of some events. For example, if you crash the ship into something, you will hear like the impact of the ship. Um, but there's also this kind of, for example, okay, this is like the collision kind of sound, which dynamically reacts to how hard you kind of crash into something with your ship. It's kind of a base layer, which is played on every collision event with some like dynamic changes of the sounds, like changing of pitch and different, like uh, a range of volume the single layers can can take part in. But we also have like layers for uh, what kind of material you crash into. So again, here we have kind of a collision velocity thing. Uh, and there's also this kind of aftermath sounds, again, where I uh, use this groaning sounds. And uh, these kind of sounds really helped to um, make the ship feel much larger. Because if you crash into something with such a large metal structure, you kind of expect to have some sort of like aftermath. Uh, and vibrations that keep on going even after mm. after the collision, and I think this was something which helped to um, uh, make the whole thing feel heavier. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot about like game events and game states. So when you break down the game mechanics, usually there's there's often like a state of a thing in a game. For example, the engine is running or it's not running, but you could also say that it can be running at uh, like at full throttle or half throttle or whatever. Um, and there's also an event of the engine is turning on and the engine is turning off. Uh, and in terms of game design, I, I, if, if something is a core mechanic in your game, like the change of a state should be very obvious and it should feel kind of cool. So <laughs> it makes a lot of sense to, to try to make these events cool. So for example, uh, here, this is the engine. Like this is the sound for, or the sounds of the engine of the ship, uh, which you see is it's quite extensive. Uh, these yellow things mean there's like a substructure beneath them. Like here, for example, this music track, which is called Damaged, has uh, other audio cues in them, which again are looping. So if we listen to this isolated, We have the loops, uh, which are just running, and then there's these sounds, which are kind of uh, hissing. 
kind of hissing sounds, which also give the ship a kind of, it's, it almost sounds like a kind of hissing or breathing, right? Uh, and you can add uh, probabilities to these sounds. So you can make very dynamic, non-repeating sounds with just a couple of these sounds, like in different variations and the probability chance um, you have quite a lot of variation already and it's very quickly to do. Um, so this is something that maybe if you don't work a lot with these trigger probabilities in FMOD, I can really recommend it for this kind of stuff where you try to uh, make something which has an ambient quality to it and you want to make it non-repetitive. Um, Okay, so this is kind of a, right, this is the sound for a stage. So basically we have a loop which starts to play when the ship engine is damaged. But we also have a stinger. For when the event of the, the ship is being damaged uh, is triggered. So the player has a clear information and a very clear indication of what's happening that's important to him. And you also get a very clear stinger when you fix the engine again and the ship is good to go. Okay, so the engine you see has a lot of subtracks. There's a lot of parameters uh, that, that are up here. Uh, for example, like what I mentioned before, there's a parameter which uh, is changed based on how much, like at what pace the engine is running. Um, some of you who may work with uh, FMOD a lot or in audio a lot will probably uh, have raised some red flags by now. Like, why do I have so many audio tracks in here? Why am I using so many audio channels? Uh, isn't this super expensive for the CPU and, and my channel count? Like, what the hell is going on here? And you would probably be very right to criticize all that. Like, this is, like, a lot of the stuff you see in here is not done in the best possible way. It's done... Like when you work on, on this kind of stuff, you always have to weigh your time versus how much performance cost is there really <laughs> on the thing. And I think sometimes when you're working on a core, core feature and it's more important that it's cool and that you are able to do it relatively quickly, uh, it's okay to do the trade-off. But uh, if you're not a programmer yourself, uh, you should definitely like keep an eye on your performance, uh, on, on the performance you use with your sound design. And uh, FMOD also provides a very great way to profile uh, how much resources you use with the profiling window, which I'm not going into right now, but uh, it's something that you definitely should have a look at. Okay, so again, like we have this engine workload parameter, which uh, basically resembles one state of, of the ship, of how fast is the, the whole thing going. And then there's other parameters here as well. And um, like with these with these parameters and these different sub layers of the whole engine sound, you already create quite a lot of diversity of how the whole thing sounds relatively easily, actually. Um, yes, maybe you have a question. I'm actually not a follow up question, but um, so the, these parameters all have a different state when one of the components of the ship is failing or is overheating or is active etc so because at the end it really sounded like a ship on life support you had this breathing 
yeah. sound and you had the the quichi 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 sound. Yes. <laughs> yes, um, exactly. So that was in so, a bad state. You had to use basically telling you repair me please otherwise. Exactly. There's yeah. like um there's the engine and the the engine can uh be in a pristine state, it can be in a damaged state and it can be in a broken state. So we have parameter for this. Like here's a, when the engine is damaged, I start to add this layer when the engine goes broken. I add this layer. Um, there's a a heat resource inside the ship. So when you when you run the oven, you build up heat, and you have to cool down the engine. So um, it doesn't overheat, and once it has overheated, we add this layer, and then there's also uh, this engine access force uh, parameter, um, which is active when either the heat fuses out or uh, like you have a lever to decide whether you want to go forward or backward and how fast you want to go forward and backward. And if you basically waste potential of your of the force you're generating with the engine, depending on the depending on how much force you're wasting. And this layer again also changes uh based on like how fast the ship is going mm -hmm. and there's also a layer to uh, like to communicate how hot the engine is again so if you use really speed this gets more and more subtle and eventually fades out mm -hmm. I guess this is the most complicated system because the ship is such a big thing and has so many parameters. Uh, yes, the engine is the most complex thing. Mm -hmm. I guess there's also other examples uh, which are kind of complicated. So like the ship has different features, right? So um, for example, the sail is also... Mm -hmm. Uh, kind of important uh, in the game. Wait a sec. Okay. Uh, so here's like the wind usage parameter, which indicates like how ma how much of the the wind is currently being used. Uh, and there's this dangling sound, which mm -hmm. starts to play if. Like there is wind, but the player isn't using it at all. So mm -hmm. uh, you you start to hear and see the sails dangling in the wind, uh, kind of anticipating to be used, um, mm -hmm. calling you. This is a means of communication. Exactly. And then there's this thing, uh, this layer of like really howling uh, when we when we really like start uh, using the sails full force mm -hmm, uh, against mm -hmm. strong winds. Yes, and we use this uh, dynamic systems a lot uh, in the game. Uh, there's also, I think, one more uh, thing which is kind of important. I said I usually don't work on ambient sounds early. Uh, I think one exception to this was the wind in the game because it's a core game mechanic as well. So it, it was really important for the players to identify whether there was wind or not and what direction it's coming from. Um, so we have like these different layers of wind sounds. And we can basically just change the panning of the sounds to indicate what direction the wind is coming from. So the player can actually hear, okay, I have wind from the front or from the side. Um, the wind also sounds different, whether or not we are uh, inside or outside the ship. But this is where it becomes just like an atmospheric kind of thing and not really critical in terms of game mechanic. Yes, please. Go on. 
It's just a quick question on the ambience design side. Are you, um, are you working on much in a linear fashion and then bringing it into FMOD? Are you designing up from the ground up on the ambient side in FMOD itself? Um, so normally what my uh, workflow looks like is that I, I like to start working in FMOD. Uh, so I, like I said, like photo bashing, I go really crazy in FMOD uh, until I have created something that I like. And then I go back to Reaper to kind of clean it up. So, <laughs> uh, for example, if we uh, look at this, uh, at the ship engine uh, example again, if I find it. Okay. Um, for example, this main layer uh, used to be maybe uh, seven or eight or 10 different sounds with all like dynamic uh, effects on them, uh, which is a nightmare in terms of CPU usage <laughs> and, <laughs> and channel count. But um, I really like to, like w when I'm trying to be creative and actually do sound design, I want to be hindered as little as possible by having to switch back and forth between different tools so i do as much as possible in fmods and then once i have it i go back to reaper and do it cleanly again I've so got a question yep. about something unrelated mm -hmm. so sort, of, sort of related but on a bit of a tangent um i've with fmod i've only worked on games that are 3d where you have the fmod listener and you know things in the world and all the spatialization and distance stuff is kind of done for you which is nice and then a little bit ago I was listening to Kevin Regamy talking about what he did on Tunic and how that's a kind of top-down isometric style game. So all that stuff is useless because, <laughs> you know, whichever way the character is facing doesn't have anything to do with what, what, what where you're listening to the sound from and you've got different planes and all that. Look, mm -hmm. So I'm starting to think more about how all that kind of stuff works. And in this 2D game, I'm kind of wondering how you dealt with panning of things like is there much panning going on do you stick with stuff like keeping it keeping most things 2d more or less like still stereo assets maybe but 2d for example the the boat which is always in the middle of the screen did you come into any big troubles or f find any interesting solutions to this kind of general problem mm -hmm. or was there even a general problem or was it all quite straightforward i think for uh the kind of like 2D side scrolling game where you uh, like move on the horizontal axis. Um, actually, the 3D placing of sounds covers a lot of ground. So in most cases, it was uh, sufficient to place the 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 sound like you would in a 3D game on the object, which is kind of emitting it, and the F mode will take care of it uh, to a large degree. Or what we did in FAR, for example, was uh, changing the position of the audio listener. <laughs> so the audio listener was neither directly on the player nor directly on the camera, but on a position kind of interpolated uh, between the two things. So you yeah. still had like uh, relative accuracy in terms of like the position on the x-axis and the y-axis, uh, but we handled the z-axis a little bit different. In far changing tides, we didn't do this. Um, so the audio listener is really on the camera itself. Um, okay. What? Any reason why? <sighs> it felt easier to, to do the mixing. Uh, okay. it, w it was kind of a workflow thing because you just have one less variable which changes like how loud <laughs> a sound uh, tends to be. And the ranges of the camera moving back and forth were much larger in changing tides than they were in far alone sails because oh. the ship is much larger. We had to, we had to handle the whole thing a little bit different. Um, but we did use in some cases, especially um, so in the game, you can move above surface and below water surface. And in some cases I um, had to program program like the modeling of, for example, a sound being audible uh, over much larger distances underwater. Um, for example, there's a whale you can hear in the game, which you hear from really far away when you're underwater, but not as far 
uh, when you're on the ship or, or uh, above surface. And for this kind of thing, uh, I uh, I added a parameter and kind of changed changed the volume uh, of of the sound systematically of the, those specific sounds that were underwater. Because I imagine if there are loads of sound underwater, then you'd have to do a lot of manual work. But if it's just the odd one, like the whale, then that sounds um, like a good. The 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 one with the whale was the uh, the one where the attenuation changed the most. Um, we also, uh, for example, there's a sonar uh, feature in the ship which produces um, kind of a response. So you have to gather resources to keep the engine of the ship running, and. Um, there's like a sonar signal to indicate where items are located so people can find them and and, and gather them uh and i added this audibility um parameter um so we can change the audibility because it was not just like an area of the thing but it was also relevant uh whether the player was in the ship and where in the ship the player was to kind of model like the the obstruction of the sound outside outside the ship. So I use this parameter to to model this kind of thing. Um, I have a question about the uh, water. Actually. And there are a lot of water around uh, the ship, and uh, I've tried to uh, closely listen uh, when you played it first for the first time. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, if the water is has its own like kind of complex system as a ship has. And if it's responsible for the movements of the ship and because like water is really complex in general and uh, all these splashes um, uh, kind of like movement of water around the ship and uh, how, how deep uh, the ship is in the water and like mm -hmm. we're counting with all of that factors. Okay, so uh, in terms of like the the overall ocean system, uh, we use Crest, which is kind of a it's a publicly publicly available Unity asset you can buy. Um, I think it was still in development when we started uh, working with it, um, and we use this to kind of uh, take care of the whole procedural generation of the waves. And the ship is actually physically reacting, like. Uh, yeah, basically, you're, you're modeling uh, basic buoyancy uh, just on, there's like a couple of points on the ship, so you don't have to calculate the whole volume of the thing, and they take care of how the ship behaves physically. Um, in terms of audio, uh, the solution is actually super simple. I Originally, I wanted to uh, create a very elaborate system uh, which allowed me to track waves and when they hit the ship so I could add really nice splashing sound effects whenever like a wave was crashing into the front of the ship and stuff. Unfortunately, uh, I didn't end up having the time to do this. So um, what we have in place right now is again, uh, similar to how the wind works, a um, a simple multi-layered loop um, with uh, a lot of different audio layers and depending on how intense uh, like the waves are And whether we are inside the ship or outside the ship, uh, this this multi-layered uh, water sound uh, kind of changes. So, so wait, you say it's not at all synchronized? <laughs> uh, it's not not at all synchronized, but it's mostly not synchronized. So um, sometimes, like in this case, this works surprisingly well. Like we had. Like we played around with different systems and I wanted to do a lot more complex stuff, 
but we realized that this relatively simple solution worked in most of the cases. If I had the resources, I would love to go back and like uh, do it much more elaborate uh, than what this is. Uh, but this was kind of the most uh, the most uh, efficient way to do it, uh, or the most efficient way I found uh, during development. What we do though is um, this is just for like the for the above surface sound, uh, and there's like an underwater ambience playing as well, depending on how far the camera is underwater. Oh, to come back to Benedict's uh, question before, in some cases we do attenuation based on, in most cases it's how far um, the camera is away. So the audio listener is on the camera, um, but most sounds which dynamically adapt on whether they're, uh, whether the player is inside the water or outside the water, uh, listen to the player's position, whereas the underwater loop of the game is actually listening to the camera position. So once the camera is underwater, uh, we will start playing this kind of um, underwater loop uh, playing in, which is audible in conjunction with the above surface stuff most of yeah. the time. But we reduce the audibility of the surface uh, the farther down uh, the player moves. And uh, we use a lot of, like, this is like the, the very, like, this covers like 80% of, of ground, so to say. But there's also sounds, for example, when the ship is crashing down into the water, uh, there is sound. And the finding out if you're crashing, is this together, do you get some information back from this buoyancy uh plug in yes. where you say oh now we have extremely high uh you know force to go up and this is when you crank the parameter up uh yes exactly so basically there's uh these swimmers okay now we see them so these are uh very basic just five positions on the ship which uh can like the whole ocean system is basically a compute shader uh and we can read back like the surface height on a given position. So these points, we call them swimmers, um, know where the water surface is. And we apply a amount of force to the ship at the position of the swimmer, depending on uh, how, how far up and down it is. And when the swimmer is not inside the water, like we can register how far inside the water it is or whether it's entering the water or not. So I can uh, forward this information to the audio system and trigger an audio event whenever that happens. This is a great debug view. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is the juice of the whole thing, right? You see all the objects, how they're laid yes. out and how the systems are working together. Yes. That's really cool. Um, I think we have one big... One more big elephant in the room. Oh, yes. Yeah, and that's the whole music system and music. Because when you played it, of course, one of the big, big, big emotional aspects is the music composition. And I think mm -hmm. when I talked to some of the guys from the group and also people at the company, they said, you know, the emotional journey that you do, that you almost cry when you get to the end, this whole storm that you showed, you have all the sounds, but the music makes it something dram into something dramatic. So how did you go about the music and the music systems. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, again, the music was uh, composed by Joel Schoch, who worked with us for Farlon Sales. And uh, it was obvious for us that we wanted to have him uh, on the boat uh, very early on in the project because uh, yeah, his, his music just adds so much uh, value to the whole game. The way we worked together with him was that very early on in the project, 
we would kind of um, do this uh, kind of vision sync meetings where we try to uh, really like communicate our vision of the game, uh, the story of the game, the player journey as well, so that he would understand what we're kind of, from our perspective, uh, the core moments of the game. Uh, and then he uh, went uh, into his uh, chamber of secrets and spent a couple of weeks uh, like working uh, completely isolated from us to kind of find uh, a musical style that he he proposed for the game. So, like I said, there's just different levels of uh, narrative uh, inside the game that you encounter. Um, and uh, for him, for example, it was very important to have two distinct styles of music uh, for these uh, two separate layers. So to to also further like uh, help the player understand that they're not one and the same thing, but like two different kind of civilizations or groups of peoples. Uh, after that, like we had always these intervals of. Uh, like we gave him the information that he needed, for example, about an encounter or when we made design decisions to cut something out that was supposed to be in the game previously, like we, of course, would let him know. Uh, but then he again worked relatively separately for a couple of weeks and presented what he came up with. And most of the time, he his process is that he starts like we give him the the current builds, the development builds with all these really terrible looking block out uh, environments, and he would play um, play the prototype to kind of get a feeling for the pacing and the main event, and look at the uh, concept art uh, for, of how it's supposed to look and feel at the end, and then try to compose a linear piece. And uh, that is kind of then the draft to go back and uh, where we discuss of how can we establish a, a dynamic structure which um, adapts to what the player is doing and what is happening. And also, uh, that's not something we do with each and every, every piece. So sometimes we just use linear pieces, if that makes sense. Uh, and it's like not a core moment of the game, but for... Um, for other places, we use very dynamic uh, musical structures so that we can make the whole musical experience feel as cinematic as possible on one hand, but we also use it to support uh, a game player guidance and game mechanic. So when you, uh, for example, this is the track where, where you find the engine for the very first time. And uh, it might look kind of crazy, uh, if you've never looked at something like this before. And this is kind of the base layer of the whole track. And then we have parameters uh, to kind of change the music depending on what the player does. So here, uh, the player is using the engine for the very first time. So for every step of actually turning on the oven and using the engine, we wanted the music to kind of progress to communicate to the player that the that he's actually progressing the game mechanic. So we have an ignition and then uh, an actual using like the speed lever and moving it to the front. And we have a parameter for, like, there's a bellow you have to jump on to turn off the heat of the ship. And so these parameters go up as the player does that several times. And then there's one more parameter for once we reach a certain position. Uh, but if the oven turns off, the whole track fades to the background again and then continues uh, with a new, like, uh, kind of elevation uh, once you've restarted the engine. So the player really fe feels rewarded for just using the core feature of the game.
So this happens when the player doesn't refuel the oven and the oven turns off. And then once we restart the engine, we kind of get looped back into the music. Which then kind of continues until you reach a certain point in the game again. And uh, we use this kind of system where we try to tie together the music on one hand with what the player is doing in terms of just like the core gameplay, but as well as uh, the mechanics of, for example, a puzzle. So when the player has to solve a puzzle, we often use like a music which progresses as the puzzle progresses uh, to kind of support and reward the player. So to me, it seems as if you have all these story beats and puzzle beats and you did a dynamic piece of music that kind of moves on, which I feel from playing adds uh, a, an amazing, tremendous cinematic feel because you really have the impression that now you move on, something new comes, the soundtrack evolves. Yes, I think it's, it's, uh, it's actually one of the core aspects of what makes far work as a kind of atmospheric experience mm. because like if you're if you're uh, someone who plays a lot of games uh far is not very challenging like neither it's not really a puzzle game there is some jump and run elements but it's not really a jump and run game and there is resource gathering but it's also not really a survival game mm. so the the game mechanics are all reduced to like the bare minimum to be able to kind of carry the whole atmosphere with like just enough gameplay and that might work for some players and not for others but uh it's actually the music which is probably like the most rewarding uh thing in the game and kind of subconsciously actually adds a lot of player agency because they actually feel mm -hmm. like they directly influence the music as well Mm -hmm. We talked about that in one of our game design uh, book club meetings, right, Benedict, where we said <laughs> actually that it, even though games m sometimes are quite straightforward and almost linear like a book, the fact that you have the agency and can stop at any time, when that gives you an, uh, an interactive experience, it makes something that might seem like a very easy, straightforward concept into something much bigger. And this is, I think, <laughs> a very good example of that, that the music and the agency you feel through the music really elevates the whole journey and makes the experience something special. How many music elements and aspects are there? I mean, you have, you have tons of music <laughs> snippets, uh, elements. I think it's 27 total tracks. That look like this? No, only 23. Oh, only 23 only. looking like this. Oh, yeah. Are, well, then. Are dynamic. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, 23. Uh, 23 are dynamic. And uh, the rest is just like uh, li relatively linear, like hmm. plug and play uh, events. But I mean, they're. Like, of course, like this was kind of crazy. Okay, this is also kind of crazy. Yeah, most of them are kind of crazy. <laughs> but um, you just forgot about it. <laughs> yes, just, yes. But there's a lot, like there's clearly some which are, are much more linear and, <laughs> and less dynamics and easier to do than like, like we said before, um, like obviously the ship is kind of the centerpiece of the whole game. So the track for when you use a feature of the ship for the first time or when you find the mm. ship for the first time, it was really important to emotionally engage the player uh, yep. in those moments uh, yep. to kind of carry them through the game. So Joel did the composition uh, track at the university. Yes, they use FMOD as well. He uh, started to use FMOD when he worked with us on Fire Lawn Sales. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. How much of that did he implement or did you implement that for him in in cooperation with him? Um, in the first game, like in the beginning, we had to work together much closer 
to kind of um, establish the whole thing. Mm. Now uh, he does like 90% of establishing like the structures in FMOD. Mm. Um, but we talked them through before. So we try to like find the mapping of like we try to establish like in what way is the track supposed to interact with what is happening in the game. So we talk about these structures first. He then builds them in FMOD. And I kind of only have to feed the information the track needs uh, back into the system. Okay. But in, in Farlon Sales, we had to work together much closer. But mm -hmm. when, like now he knows the tool so well. Yep. Uh, and he understands like uh, most of the common mm -hmm. pitfalls or problems yep. you can yep. encounter. I think that is an advantage, I would say, of FMOD because it's so similar to a DAW that you use. So once you get mm -hmm. your head around the concept of these track markers and jump points, it, mm -hmm. it you you can use it to your advantage pretty quickly. Yes, absolutely. It's mm -hmm. it's. Um, I think it's more intuitive than Vice, although like we started to look into it as well. And I think if you spend some time with it, like it's, it's, uh, I think it's a great tool and you can totally uh, wrap your head around it, even if you're not a programmer. But FMOD is kind of, it's less, I think it's less intimidating on the first glance. Less intimidating, yeah. I think you're looking to start a fight there, though. <laughs> <laughs> is it a religious, religious uh, discussion? Why is there FMOD? Uh, it could be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I personally, I just, I have more experience in FMOD, obviously, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um, I would totally consider using Vice. Mm -hmm. It's just that for um, so far, I haven't seen a good enough reason mm -hmm. to kind of throw away all the established workflows and stuff uh, th that we established previously uh, to change tools. Yeah. I think we touched on it a little bit at the beginning where you said you have to have a balance between what you record yourself and sounds you buy, make a decision how much time you spend optimizing really every bit you can squeeze out of the memory versus just going with it and doing a creative decision. Mm -hmm. If it isn't limiting or, or throwing errors and, and out of memory something, mm -hmm. then you're safe to leave it and that's the the same decision with f do you use f mode or wise if you start with wise then by any means stay there and your workflow isn't broken and you are not limited why throw away the knowledge you have built up over the last four years in uh, with with a vision of maybe you get something out of it but you don't know so as long as it isn't broken stay with the tool you know Yes, yeah. I think we are working on a new project now, which I'm not allowed to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but we uh, we we started concepting a little bit about uh, about it, and we started looking into Vice specifically. Mm -hmm. um, but there's like this uh, this command instruments in FMOD, which are very powerful, which we haven't used so far. Uh, which I think allow you to do almost everything that you can do in Vice. But it's we, we realize that I think this is kind of the point where you have to, like if you're, if you're working with FMOD so far and you start to use uh, like command instruments a lot, you might, uh, it might be worth it to look into Vice because at some point I think the, the structure of Vice uh, allows you to easier keep keep a good overview mm -hmm. uh, of these things than FMOD, mm -hmm. but I might be wrong. Like I haven't done, if, like I haven't done enough practical work to feel like I can like uh, give yeah. a, a clear verdict on it. Are you moving to Unreal <laughs> with your new project? Uh, no, we aren't. Mm. <laughs> also, there the knowledge you built up. If the project allows for Unity. I mean, this is something we saw in our studio. Unity has very quick turnaround and iteration times. Mm -hmm. uh, and Unreal just has a totally different stack where people need to compile projects. Building uh, shaders. 
compile shaders, <laughs> compiling shaders, whatever. <laughs> and and it, but it allows it allows to to uh, do other things very very well. Uh, Absolutely, I yeah. think I think it really um, it really depends on your requirements. Yeah. But even with the requirements, if you have established uh, like a lot of workflow and stuff on on one tool, it's probably cheaper. Uh, at least in the scale of project that we do right now, it makes a lot of sense, I think, to stick with the tools that you know how to use. Yeah. Fabio, <laughs> thank you very, very much. It's so cool to see how you work and look into your projects and look at the behind the scenes of the Unity thing and see how you approach these things. Thank you so much for having me. It was it's been really interesting. interesting. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks so much for your time, Fabio. That was that was really awesome. Thank you. That was really nice. Thanks everyone for chiming in. Have a great weekend. <laughs>